light, it's not the best. But you guys can get the idea. So, how do I identify <coughs> mushrooms? What I'd like you to do is not necessarily take a lot of notes at the beginning. I want you to just get some, there's some conceptual things and a lot of the clock, the, a lot of this is just kind of getting your head around some of the, uh, how mushrooms get named and how they get classified because how they get named and how they get classified is a really common sense approach. And just to be able to understand kind of what's going on and what you're kind of thinking about and what kind of, how science is kind of built and developed on that um, is kind of what this is about. So how do I identify mushrooms? Well, I think it's self-explanatory picture. So if you're picking mushrooms, you need to get a name. I don't care if it's an old Ukrainian name like Papanki or whatever it is, as long as it's the, as long as it represents the mushroom. That's the important thing. In a lot of cases, there's lots of name changes, and in fact, some of the things that I'm telling you is out of date, but that's in the date of this book, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. It doesn't matter if it's the mushroom is the shaggy parasol, or a Macrolepiota ricodes, or a chlorophyllum ricodes of what it is now, the mushroom formerly known as, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a person, you know? I mean, you get to know a person, and sometimes they get married, and they change their name. Well, you still know the person. You know, nothing's really changed. You know, once you know it, it doesn't matter what the name is. Call them by their maiden name, you know? If, I knew a guy who, uh, and typically when a name change happens, it happens because there's been a whole bunch more information has come along. So I used to know a guy by the name of David, and he became Amber. <laughs> and well, I still recognize him as the kind of the same organism, the same thing, you know, it's a different name. And in that process of being renamed, we got to know a whole lot more about him. <laughs> we probably got to know more than we wanted to know. <coughs> and so a lot of people get frustrated when names get changed, but don't worry about it. Once you get to know a mushroom, you know, it doesn't matter what it's called. Um, and don't get mad when they change the name, because find out why, because there's usually the reason. Anyway, so if you're ingesting them, you need to know them. So what makes it a challenge? Well, number one, there's no general rules. Absolute, there's no, you know, the old wives tale, I rub a silver coin on it, and if it turns the coin black, then I can't eat it. Or if it turns onions this color, or if it does that. Those may have been good little rules for some village in, in, you know, in, in Russia or Latvia or the Ukraine where they were telling the difference between three different mushrooms that they typically picked. And there was one lookalike, and this is how you told the lookalike part. They're not general rules, they're just kind of, so ignore general rules because there are none. And in fact, that one, that general rule, of course, it's a general rule, so it's really not that loud. Um, so you need to know each one absolutely. There's the general rule, but there's lots of exceptions to that one. So typically, if you can't put a name on it, you shouldn't eat it or you shouldn't feed it to somebody or whatnot. But there's some exceptions, and we'll go through those exceptions as we come across them. So, if you know your tree species in the province, there's probably 150, if we, 150, 160 trees. And if we count all the willows and all the dwarf birches and all of those stuff, trees are just so easy because there's only 150. Of them. So, mushrooms, so they're estimated between 12 and 25,000. And typically, the next part, part of the problem with mycology, they, when they find one plant on surveys, typically you find six mushrooms for every one plant. So in life you would think that there should be six, more, six times more mycologists than botanists. But alas, that's not the case. So that's also part of the problem. In Alberta, we probably have large fleshy fungi in the range of six to ten 12,000. 
So a law of different mushrooms. And so this mushroom field guide, Mushrooms of Alberta, of Western Canada, or Mushrooms of Northwest North America, is the recommended field guide because it was written locally by a local person and they looked at Alberta mushrooms and the odd one when they went on holidays in BC and whatnot. It has our mushrooms in it. And there's 550 species of mushrooms in here. And I know quite a few of them, most of them, but not all of them. And that's a far cry from the six to 8,000 that are out there. And there's the dilemma. There's so many more mushrooms than are in the book. And I'll tell you, but don't feel despair. If you actually get the book and you learn all of them, then I'll get you to be do, to do this course the next time we do it. Because you'll be a bona fide mushroom expert. There's no doubt about it. You know, 550, I mean, 100 mushrooms is a lot. 25 mushrooms is... Is, is good and that's you kind of build your repertoire and learn a few or learn a bit of a group and focus on a group and, and away we go. So many mushrooms aren't in field guides which makes it really hard and frustrating to find out what we've got and that's why these forays are wonderful because we get people with that pull names out that know stuff that and then we also deal with stuff that's new. So every year we find new species records for the province. Last year, I think, at our foray, we had four or five new species. And, uh, and I mentioned, and, and often brand new species. I wouldn't be surprised if we find something really unique here, just because this valley is such a unique place in Alberta, really diverse, and a lot of really neat stuff grows here. So wouldn't be surprised if we come up with stuff like that. So if you've got a new species in your hand, and you're going through your book to find it. And if not just have one book, but I've got five or six books, that's the frustrating part. And that's what makes Mushroom ID a challenge. And that's why they call mycology the indoor, the intellectual outdoor activity. So if you like problem solving and cryptic puzzles and all kinds of stuff like that, oh, you're going to love this. <laughs> this is going to be great. So, quick introduction, just so you kind of know, and a little bit about the role of the ecosystem, plus a few definitions. So we're going to kind of go through this kind of stuff a little bit. So this is what most fungi look like. This is it, their little hyphae, mycelium thing. And then what we do is, every once in a while, for some generally unknown reason or trigger, they start to put off a fruiting body because they want to and then we come along and yank off their reproductive organs. <laughs> but what we do is we leave behind this thing <coughs> here again. And typically what we found is that yanking off their reproductive organs doesn't really hurt them. And uh, in fact, a lot of times it just causes more fruiting for them to have. Um, so the mushroom that you're picking is different than the organism that's there. So a lot of times the organisms there are doing a bunch of different things. Um, so of course, it's one of three kingdoms we can see typically without a microscope. So we've got the animal kingdom, the plant kingdom, and we've got the kingdom of fungi. And then we've got bacteria and amoebas and, and little slime molds and plasmodiums and all kinds of other things. And they're kind of really work, reworking this whole thing. But the three biggies are fungi, plants, and animals. And and fungi came down the same evolutionary tree as the animals do. So we're much clo more closely related to, to fungi than we are to plants. And, and in so many ways, I mean, you take, and mushrooms act, act in, in that way in a lot of ways. I mean, some mushrooms, if you leave them out in the sunlight, they tan. They tan because they have to protect themselves from, from UV rays. And they tan with things called melanin. The same thing that we can with, to protect ourselves from UV. You know, if you leave mushrooms out in sunlight, they develop vitamin D just like we do. So all of that stuff is really, really similar. They just, we just don't look for it. <laughs> so, a number of years ago, in the mid-90s, uh, the North American Mycological Association, NAMA, polled their members and said, 
give some advice to people starting out. So number one, buy and use good field guides. And we're going to really encourage that. We've got some field guides here. You know, the one we've, the one for the course is this one, and it's a really good one if you know how to use it. And we're going to talk a little bit more this afternoon on how to use this field guide really well. And we'd like you just to spend a lot of the weekend experimenting and having fun. And there's other field guides around, and you can borrow those and, and look through them. And, uh, and don't hesitate. The more you have, the merrier. And so that will be a big part of this course. Um, go with experience pickers. So again, you know, anybody that you know, if you know your old grandmother who knew three, learn those three from her and learn three from, you know, the, the guy down the street and go up to forays or go up to different things and stick along, try and find the most intelligent person you can find there and stick to them. And, and when this lady was writing the book and I was just starting out, I was there with my pencil and paper and she was naming the mushrooms and I was writing the lists. And so I learned how to spell stuff and I learned how. And you make the list and all of a sudden you think, hmm, I really, you know, you find that mushroom again and I say, oh, I've seen that. And I think it was last year on that foray. So I go back to the list and say, okay, oh, it could have been this, this or that. And I look at one of the three and yeah, that's the one. So, but just getting yourself versed in, in mushrooms. So go out where you can with experienced pickers. Take a mushroom class, you're doing that. There's not a lot of them to be had. Um, keep field notes. And Patrick and, and uh, Patrick and Tom are going to go through field notes in much, in great detail. This lady, when she started out, she was a botanist. And she was, actually she was, a, she was a, a homemaker. And her husband worked in the forestry. She came from Holland. She was trained as a botanist and never practiced at all, raised a family, and at the age of about 52 or 53, as her kids were growing up, she decided to take up painting. So she gets out and we've got some of her early work, and some of her early work is not very good. And she would paint mushrooms, because mushrooms are great subjects, because they don't move very fast <laughs> and whatnot, and, and uh, you don't have to have them sign a waiver that, you know, they won't sue you. <coughs> and stuff like that. But anyways, but her frustration was is if she painted it, she wanted to put a name on it. So what she would do is she would she would take the little picture and dry the specimen and take some little notes that she would that she would send it off to the herbarium in Ottawa. And the guys in Ottawa picked these little things up and said, Oh look at that. Isn't that nice? And we actually in, in 2010, we had our memorial foray, and we had the first mycologist she wrote to there, David Mallet. And she said, and he said, oh, I was so impressed. Somebody came along and actually drew the little picture and made really good field notes. And if I have somebody who takes that much time on something, I'm going to take the time to work on the specimen. And then what they did is they started looking, and they discovered that in Alberta there are no mushrooms because they go through all the records in the herbarium and all the samples because mushrooms don't grow in Alberta because according, in Ottawa, according to Ottawa, they have no record of them. And so she was the first person that came along and started to do these field records. I mean there's a few other records but very, very few. And what ended up happening is she got fairly good at art and, and finally her work hung in the Museum of Natural History in Ottawa. And, uh, and most of her work has been identified and verified by really some real eminent mycologists like Dr. Scott Redhead and, and Dr. Jim Ginns and David Malik and stuff like that, who she worked with. And, and, and all from taking good field notes. And that's how she learned and started at the age of 50 or a little bit older. Just, and became very, very positive. There's hope for the rest of us. <laughs> exactly, you know. And join a mycological society. So that's another one that all of you have. Congratulations. So, making sense out of the chaos. So a lot of times you'll find that maybe you don't understand see that mushrooms are fairly chaotic, but you know, by the end of the weekend you might get a feel of that it actually is. So one of the things that that we do is when we start figuring it out. You know, well, mushrooms don't care what name we put to them. 
you know, and they're not really offended if we don't call them by their proper name, by their proper Latin name, or that, you know, we can, we can even call them by their vulgar common name and stuff like that. And they don't care. Um, so it's just a purely human construct, the whole naming of mushrooms. And so imagine going into a grocery store where things aren't in any order. People have just, you know, the stock boy started and the first shelf that had space, he started putting stuff up and, you know, and how in the world would you ever find anything in a grocery store? So what they actually do is they start organizing these grocery stores into different sections so that we can actually find stuff. And that's kind of what's happened with Fungal Kingdom. They've kind of organized it in a very human way. And most people are just very resistant to kind of deal with this, this human way of doing it. So as we end up going through, we end up, for example, on the condiment aisle. Well, that's kind of what we want to do with our mushrooms. We want to end up on the condiment aisle of, or a aisle of a group of mushrooms that have similar characteristics. Because then all of a sudden we've got the choice of getting them all together and starting to figure out how of what different things are. And as we kind of we kind of get to the right part of the store, then we focus in on, well, the condiments, because that's what I'm that's what I'm after. And as we go through, we found, oh excellent. Here's what I've got. That's ketchup. That's what I want. Now I've got a whole bunch of different species of ketchup. I've got a whole bunch of different types. So I get to learn a little about which one do I want, which one's important to me. So I've got a whole different ones, and this is all of a sudden where we now are picking up labels and or books and or stuff and starting to look closely. But we're already in the aisle. And as we go along, we find weird things like, well, that doesn't look at all like ketchup. <laughs> you know, what the hell is that? But it's the same. And so a lot of times when we're dealing with fungi, we get the same things. We get things that are similar. There's certain similarities to them, but a lot of times there's some diversity. Because ketchup comes looking like that. Look at that. That's a fat squat ketchup. That's not a tall, thin ketchup. Like, what's up with them? But they're the same thing, or they're very close, or they're very similar. And, and, so, and then we get these bizarre things as well. You know? And it's all ketchup. And, and so it's just, part of it is trying to learn to recognize where some of the similarities are and where the things are grouped. So it's kind of really important. And then, you get green ketchup. Like, yeah, what the hell is this? You know, ketchup's supposed to be red. And we have somebody come along and tell us, no, no, that's actually not ketchup. That's something else. But anyways, yeah. So it comes in all kinds of shapes and forms. Just like, and that's the same thing you'll find with mushrooms. Like, this is the same as that. And, but when you start looking a little closer at it, and somebody, and that's again why having somebody with a little more experience around, they can say, well yeah, take a look here. Like when we're gonna see honey mushrooms. We're gonna see a ton of honey mushrooms, and people are gonna say, that's a honey mushroom? But this is a honey mushroom. And, they're the same things, and when you start, when you pick it up and you say, okay, I'm starting to see the little similarities. So that's one of the tough things in mushrooms, is kind of getting through all of those variations and changes. And then of course to read the labels, or read the descriptions. And the descriptions, if the mushroom you have, if the mushroom you have just, well, it fits that description, except, well, gee, the spore color is the wrong thing. Well, you have a different mushroom. Some things don't change and vary, and some things you just have to stick to. Anyway, so using scientific names. So people resist this, and I resisted it. I resisted it. I didn't want to know the scientific names. I didn't care. I wanted to know if I could eat it. You know, that's what I wanted to know, and it was just that simple. And now, amazingly, I don't care if I can eat it anymore. Because <laughs> I know I can eat it. I can eat all. Anyways, so using scientific names. When I decided to use scientific names, and the day I think I decided, I was reading some book on on Bolitz, on Suillus, and they were saying, this Suillus, I can't remember which one it was, grows under populous tremoloides. And I thought, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> 
Now not only do I have to learn the stupid mushroom names, yeah. I have to learn the stupid trees too. <laughs> and so I kind of gave up fighting and, and I learned. And one of the things you'll find in Lenny Shalkwick's book is, and I think, I must, I think, that one of the reasons that when you go through all of these little, all of her descriptions, so find, find your lineup. So, means like a small flame. Because every time I had to write them down, I said, what does that mean? What does that mean? What does that mean? And she kept telling me all these meanings of the Latin words. And all of a sudden, stuff made sense. Oh yeah, that makes sense. So this is hypomyces. Hypo means on. Myces means mushrooms. So this is a fungus that grows on a mushroom. So this is one of the, what we call lobster mushrooms. So what a beautiful name, on a mushroom. That's its first name, and or actually its last name. And Ludeovirens is the species name. Well, Ludeo is yellow, and Virens is green. And if you pick this mushroom and you know it at all, what happens is that as it grows, it turns, it's slightly yellow, and then it turns green. And that's, and so here we've got a perfectly descriptive name of, of what this mushroom is. And it just makes sense. And as you get used to it, you'll find that you have different hypomyces. So there are all these mushrooms that grow where the fungus grows on top of another one, and they're all lumped together in these hypomyces. And there's Lactiflorum, that's the orange one, that's the orange lobster mushroom that you find sometimes in stores and growing in BC everywhere. Anyways, and Ludio, you'll see Ludio a lot, you'll see Swillus Ludius, and you'll see Russell Ludius, and because they're all yellow. So once you kind of get used to some of those words, they'll come up again and again. Okay, that makes sense. Or virescence, or virant, green, so we've got lots of things, rubra, red. Brevipedes, that's the one Tom, uh, Tom was looking for. So what is brevipedes? Brev is short, past his foot. Short-footed mushroom. So it's this short-footed little soil. And so, and we've got Russell brevipedes, and we've got a bunch of other brevipedes. We've got a soil of pseudo brevipedes. That's a false short. But you know, so, but once you learn them, it just makes life so much easier. Here's another example. Thalus rabbi. So, well, you know, <laughs> there you go. It describes the mushroom. Actually, we had another one over there. Um, Melanie's inputting it. It's called Felinus tremulae. Well, this is the Thalus. Well, Felinus is a diminutive of that, so it's actually the little penis mushroom that grows on trees. Anyway, Rabinelli, whenever you see this, when you see the two eyes, typically that's named after a mycologist or somebody who deserves to be named after. Um, Douglas fir is actually pseudosuga, so tsuga is, is hemlock, and it's a pseudosuga, so it's actually a false hemlock. Menzii, and Menzies is the mycologist, or the botanist that it was named after. I don't know if he discovered, if he actually discovered it, or he was just a British. Scottish name, actually Douglas. Douglas yeah. found it, and he named it after Manson. Yeah, so anyways, yeah. hmm? You don't name stuff after yourself. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Anyway, so here's a story. I don't know if it's made up or not. So Ravenelli, I was Charles Ravenel, famous American mycologist who lived in in the uh, in the States in the mid 1850s. And apparently, there was a German mycologist who really didn't like him. And so apparently, and this, and this famous here, this, this famous Rapinelli eye is actually a tiny little <laughs> So the story goes is that, that this German, his name was Wola, ended up naming this mushroom after Rapinelli because whenever he thinks of a very little brick. <laughs> and apparently Ravenel ended up naming a slime mold after <laughs> and slime molds are these plasmodium things that kind of move around and one of the famous ones is dog vomit slime and it just looks like well it looks like dog vomit except dog vomit 
doesn't move around on your lawn? And dog vomit slime does. And they can tell the difference because, oh, look, the slime mold is moving and the regular dog vomit is just sitting there. <laughs> and so clearly there's this one that looks like, well, a piece of dung that moves. And ergo, he was named after the German mycologist. <laughs> anyway, so we honor some of our mycologists because they're neat stories and they're neat stuff. And I used to be annoyed at this at, at Ravinelli I because I wished. Well, give me something. Give me something else. You know, some other information. Well, until we found a new genera of mushrooms at the Lenny Shalkwick Memorial Foray, which is going to be named after her. So, and then all of a sudden, yeah, it all makes sense to me. So, anyway, those are scientific names. So get to use them, and it doesn't matter how you pronounce it. It's okay. There's an armillaria, I pronounced it Sinopina. How is it? How did you pronounce it? I've never heard it pronounced before. So. Oh, okay, and you would have pronounced it. He would say Sinopina. <laughs> but we know what we're talking about, and we don't care. I'm not offended that you're pronouncing it like that. No, yeah, that's fine, and I'll continue it unless he gives me a good argument why I should pronounce it a different way. So most people are threatened to use the Latin because they don't want to use, sound like an idiot. It's okay. You know, it's all right to be an idiot. It doesn't matter. You go to, you get together, and people talking about the same mushroom in the same conversation pronounce it a different way, and it just, it's okay. You're just communicating information. So use scientific names. So basically, everything's divided up into these kingdoms, and the kingdoms are divided up, and that's thanks to Linnaeus. And this is kind of what I was trying to say when we go into a grocery store. When we go into a grocery store, there's lots of sections. I mean, think of a superstore. I mean, you know, we've even got, we've even got clothes and different things like that. We've organized it. I mean, when we could have organized, that store could have been organized all kinds of different ways. It could have been organized alphabetically. It could have been organized by color. All the red stuff goes over here, you know, so the beets go together with the red meat, but the chicken's down at the other end with the white stuff with the beans and the other stuff, but it makes sense, you know, because, you know, there's ways to organize it. So what we end up doing is we start dividing it up. So that big superstore, we divide into a grocery section, and in the grocery section, in the grocery store, we've got a food section, and the food section can be divided up into baked goods and, and, and frozen foods and meats and all of these things, and we end up having a grocery department, and the grocery department we find our chips and all kinds of different things, and our condiments and whatnot. But we end up with a canned goods aisle where we've got canned fruit and canned vegetables and stuff like that, and beans and, and pickles. And, and we end up in the canned vegetables until we find the pea section. And we get to the pea section, and now we've got lots of varieties of peas. And those are our species of peas. So that's the way we live our lives as humans, we figure stuff out in this manner, and that's the way everything's been figured out in the fungal kingdom. And if you kind of go along in these things and, and learn these kind of groupings, then away you go. So we're going to quickly go through that. So for example, the shaggy mane is a primus primatus, and it's in, so it's in a group of primus, there used to be lots of mushrooms in it, and now the mycologists have come along and decided that, no, well, actually, there's only one or two coprinus. Most of everything now has become coprinopsis. When you hear opsis, and these things, glossaries are in the book and Latin translations, opsis means kind of like. So now it's coprinopsis. So it's kind of like this old coprinus, which are all these things that used to grow on dung. So they found stuff to grow on dung and they lumped it all together and, and typically these things had black or bar dark spore prints. And they were a group of mushrooms that had gills as opposed to pores. And they had, and the gills are kind of a fertile surface on the back of the mushroom, on the bottom of the mushroom, as opposed to a puffball, which doesn't have a fertile surface, or some other things. And they're part of a division called Pisidio Mycota, and we're going to touch on that right away. So, what I'm trying to tell you, this is stuff that you guys should just, you don't have to take notes or memorize this. This is stuff that you guys already know, and in general, you it's really intuitive stuff, and I'm just kind of getting you familiar with 
with why it's intuitive, because it's such a human construct. So we've got two major divisions. We've got ascomycetes, and we've got basidiomycetes. So these are microscopic characteristics, and that's the first great divide in the mushroom world. And it's a really easy divide to get, well, generally it's an easy divide to get through um, between what's an ASCO and what's not an ASCO. ASCOs are typically cup fungi, so you get these little things that look like cups or saucers or dishes. Um, and typically what they don't have is they don't have gills or pores or teeth or anything, other structures. Here we've got a morel, one of our famous ASCOs. And what it is, it's like a bunch of cups that are just together, all joined up together. And, and evolutionists say that they join all together so they raise themselves higher up so that when the wind comes or a raindrop hits that the spores are liberated from higher and it can float out. A creationist will tell you that God made them this way because if you cut them in half, they're actually hollow so that you can actually stuff them with salmon and cream cheese. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, both have a really good argument. <laughs> We're going backwards. Um, so, Helvella after another cup function. Well, here's a cup that's just done that. And, but again, the big thing is it doesn't have teeth, it doesn't have gills. It doesn't have any of those other things that we find typically with mushrooms. It doesn't have pores, tubes. Um, so when it doesn't have that, you're thinking, hmm, that could be an asco. And then you go, yeah, that's the part of you. Then we have basidiomycetes. So basidios, I'm going to stand on a little basidia or base. And on there, typically, there's four little mushrooms, four little spores that grow. Some actually grow two spores. But the big thing here is, is that these guys are gill, pore, puff balls, tooth fungi, puff fungi. That hypomyces that we talked about earlier, that little lobster thing, the one that grows on the other mushroom, well that's actually a little cup fungi that grew on a basidiomycete. So that one had gills and it was a little cup. And how would you know that? Well that one you don't see cups. Sometimes you need a hand lens to see tiny little like structures, but again, once we've got that asco part of the of the uh, of the hypomyces, it doesn't have gills or pores or teeth or anything else. So if it doesn't have any of those things, you kind of default. Oh, it might be one of these. So, basidiomycetes. So when we kind of go now, we kind of basidiomycetes end up breaking into a couple of different classes. Hymenomycetes, and these are these are all mushrooms that have that fertile layer. So a fertile layer, that's where all the genetics or all the spores are created, and and so it's just one of those things that you don't have to know. But what's starting to become interesting is we get the Garicales. So the Garicales, who knows the Garicus? Garicus is the big, the big portabellas and all of those. They're the classic gilled mushroom. And in fact, they're the representative, that's why they're one of the first ones that kind of were noted because they're around and they around, grow around people. So that's kind of the classic. And that's why all gilled mushrooms were agaricales. And in fact, when they first started dividing the kingdoms up, all mushrooms with gills were agaricals. That was their name. And then other people came along and said, well, hang on. That can't be right, you know, because there's these things have got some different characteristics. And they say, okay, you're right. You know, brown spored ones can't be the same as white spored ones. Well, maybe let's split them apart and we'll keep. But agaricus still ends up as an agaricus because that was the first one that was named. So they're the gilled mushrooms and lots of different gills. Then we've got boatanes. They're the mushrooms with two supports. And that's our king, Blink, right there. Which we'll we've got one on the table. It's a little rough shape. Somebody found one yesterday. Very delicious edible. And we're going to be talking more about them tomorrow afternoon. And polypores. So there's another one with pores. But here actually we've got pores with the bolis. We have really more like tubes. And these guys are 
these beautiful, also known as chicken of the woods or sulfur shelves, and they're really tasty edible unless you live in BC. And they're not tasty because they grow on my mock and some of the stuff like that. But here, very nice. And then we've got these aphilophorins. Actually, interesting here. A means not. Phyla means gills. Phyla. So sometimes we have these little, we'll see, tricholoma, leucophyla. Well, what does leuco means white? And phyla means gill. So it's the white gill and tricholoma. And, and this means that it doesn't have that. So basically, this is a group where they lumped all the stuff together that doesn't have gills or pores or tubes. And we have stuff like these hedgehogs, which are the tooth fungi. These ones are actually being moved off to the chanterelle family. Because, well, they're actually chanterelles in disguise. You know, everybody wants to pick chanterelles, and these guys disguise themselves, because chanterelles are really tasty. But hedgehogs are really tasty, too. In fact, they taste just like chanterelles. They're sweet. And when you cut them open, they're kind of the same color. And they usually don't get buggy. Chanterelles. And they usually hang around a long time in the field. They don't rot, just like chanterelles. So in every which way, they're a chanterelle, except they got these teeth instead of these kind of wrinkly, wrinkly gills coming down the side. So, so the mycologists came along and said, "Hang on, we're changing the name of this. They haven't changed the name yet, but we're changing the grouping. It's now in the chanterelle family." And you go, "No." But actually, it's given us a whole bunch more information about it. And it gets us to recognize the mushroom and how actually tasty and delicious it is, because it's really a souped up chanterelle, is what that guy is. So, lots of clubs. Um, they're in the group. And here's one of these kind of chanterelle like mushrooms. We don't have chanterelles, but we've got one chanterelle. In Alberta. So this kind of has wrinkles or folds on it. One of the pinks here is a really tasty little guy. Actually, a big guy. Pretty big mushroom. So those are kind of so those are those hymenomycetes, these things with with you know these fertile spore layers. And then we've got a bunch of mushrooms that are these gastromycetes. So here the, the mushrooms are enclosed, or the spores are enclosed, so it's a puffball. So for example, that's a gastromycete. We've got all kinds of different ones, and we've all kinds of different different genuses. So we've got Caldacia and Lycoperdon. Lycoperdon, by the way, is a great one. I always kids love this. Lyco is uh, wolf, and Perdon is fart. And so these <laughs> things are wolf farts, and Perlata means that it's just pearly. So it's a pearly wolf fart, if you're translating. And, and you know, the you know, if you're not prejudiced against the lab or the scientific, like little kids are, they're not. You know, they're cool with that. You know, we don't have any asparagus for dinner. Yeah, that's all right. I'll accept that word. I'll accept. And they love the lycoperdon. I don't know why. They just think that's the best. Um, another, bird, another group that falls in that gastros are, are, the, are the birds nest again because these things start coming in closed and then we'll come the spores from inside. And there, I mean, some of this stuff is has been moved and, and moving around, but since we're using this, I'm kind of going by this guide, and this is the one that you guys in Alberta are going to rely on for a little while until we have a new field power. They're marking it all. Um, anyway, so the next thing which we naturally do is we determine the, the habitat or the role. So this is something that we talked about earlier. You know, when you're in the woods and picking the mushrooms, see if you're if you're beside a Douglas fir. So again, you just have to take note of these things because it's really important. So first of all, when you walk up to a mushroom, you can see, oh look, I've got a killed mushroom. I mean, you don't have to write in your note that I've got an agaric halis. You're already known. i got a killed mushroom, or i got a poured mushroom, or i got a puffball. So you're already making these great big divisions. You're racing through great parts of the grocery store because you're already in the aisles. I got the killed mushroom. Now I know, I know something about it. And now you're gonna say, okay, what's it doing out there? Well, it's doing a bunch of different things. So we got three major roles. 
There's saprophytes, and typically a lot of saprophytes grow in fairy rings. Here's a big fairy ring. This fairy ring is probably, probably 120, 130 meters wide. You just see the little arc in the fairy ring. Of course, you know, on your lawns, you've got the little fairy rings. Little fairy rings. Well, you know, the little fairy rings are in lawns because, well, the little fairies are too afraid of the forest. Only the big fairies are going to the forest. And they dance around in these circles, and then they use the little stools to sit down on them. Right. So anyway, so there's fairies. What we're saying is that there's fairies in the forest, and there's fairies on in urban areas on lawns. And typically, the ones in the forest are bigger fairies, because the little fairies shouldn't be. And why? What happens is this happens. So you, you have some mycelium developing, and what happens is that it develops out. And typically, the active, the most active uh, cells are at the end, and this is where typically they're fruiting. And so that's why we get these things growing dark strings. And again, so the fungus continues. Again, we're just yanking off the reproductive organs, ripping them off, and uh, leaving it. In fact, what one of the famous ones is the pine mushroom. Pine mushrooms are saprophytes. They grow like this under pine. And what the Japanese will do, what we do in North America is we come along with big rakes or, or maybe, you know, something with a big blade and we'll just scoop off all the moss and, oh, there they are, pick them, pick the mushrooms and that's it for that spot until the next 30 or 40 years until everything, the habitat redevelops. What the Japanese actually do is, they say, oh, there's a thing. And they stick a stake in the center of it. Every year they measure out, figure out how much it's growing. This year, last few years, it grew this big. This year, it's growing that big. And then they go in and then they reach around with their hand and fall oh, there. There it is. I can feel it. So it's like a doctor palpating the ground, you know. And, they, and then they pull out these pine mushrooms that they pay hundreds of dollars a pound for. And, uh, and the ring stays. Next year, it grows a little bit bigger. So lots of stuff grows in rings. And that, lupo, that ring that we saw was Lupopensilis giantius, again, a marvelous mushroom. These things are about that big, and they're edible, and for some reason, they don't break down. They don't, they're really very strong antibiotic properties or some kind of things, because they hang around for weeks. They can be sometimes two or three weeks old before they finally collapse. So some mushrooms come and go in a day. These guys hang around for a long time. So, symbiotic partners, that's the coolest thing. Mycorrhiza, mycorrhiza is the neatest thing because what happens is myco means mushroom, rhiza means root, and they form this symbiotic relationship. And so, this is really important stuff. It's important because if you understand that they form relationships, if, for example, you're looking for, well, Suillus comatosis, or like Tom is looking for Suillus brevity. Well, he knows they form a relationship with pine, and he's not looking for them anywhere but in a pine forest. That's where he's going because that's the only place they grow. So what basically happens is that here we've got the little runty root, and here we've got the mycelium. And typically, what the mycelium does, it does a bunch of different things. So it adds hundreds of, th hundreds of thousands of kilometers on of, on of roots to every tree, and this is the stuff that's protecting and, and picking up the nutrient and bringing, bringing all the phosphorus and the moisture and the water and all these minerals to the tree. The roots are there. I mean, you learned in school when they, when they lied to you in school and said the roots are down there to feed. Well, the roots are down there to secure the tree so it doesn't fall over and make the mycorrhizal connection with, with the mushrooms. And the mushrooms are the ones that actually feed the trees, and what the mushrooms get from it is they get some of the photosynthesis, because just like us, we don't photosynthesize, neither do mushrooms. We can't change, we can't blast apart <coughs> photons and make sugars out of using that make, to make sugars in our own system, but trees do. And so everybody wants some of the action, including us. So as soon as the tree a seedling sprouts, then there's hormones that the mushroom puts up that causes branching. And if you ever have a question in any science class, 
and, and about any, just about any, any or any botany class about anything, whatever the question is, the answer is most likely surface area. Why does that happen? Because of surface area. So what the mushroom is trying to do is create all these branching on the, on the roots so that there's more surface area to interact with the mushroom and exchange this stuff. So interestingly, of course, mushrooms are very antibiotic. I mean, that's how penicillin works. Penicillin works because it's a mushroom and it's antibiotic. And what does it do? It's out there killing bacteria for us. No, it doesn't give a shit about us. What it's out there doing is having lunch. And what it eats is bacteria because bacteria is the best source of protein. And so mushrooms are eating lots of bacteria, and in that process they end up protecting the trees. So in here actually you can see where it's kind of grown right into the tree root, and that's where that exchange happens. And the coolest thing is, so when you get into, into an ecosystem, it's all joined together by the mushrooms. So what does that mean? It means that when the big tree is up there hogging all the light, and the little tree is trying to struggle to make a go of it. The mushroom root connects the tree from the big tree to the little tree, and it shuffles sugars that the big tree makes to the little tree so it can grow. And it shuffles that amongst the whole community out there. So, and how do they know this? Because they do radio, they inject radioactive tracing dyes into one tree, and within four to five hours, it's in the trees beside it and it's all my mushroom roots, so it's all interconnected. So the mushrooms are out there protecting the roots and interconnecting the trees and sharing the nutrient and sharing the pool of everything that goes on. And so that's why these things are, are really cool things doing this, but also really important to know that, well, I've got a mycorrhizal mushroom and I need to know what forest I'm in because that's a critical thing and when I go to identify them. Because there's some mushrooms that only grow on certain things. So we got parasites. So it's one of the many roles of the honey mushroom, the armillaria. Armillaria is hated by foresters because foresters, well, won't say they don't know something. Well, they don't know. They don't know something. They don't want. They don't know about honey mushrooms. So honey mushrooms, they hate them because it kills so many pine trees and conifers, and it plays such a critical role. After a fire, typically, you have the pine cones release and reseed to the tune of 80 to 100,000 seeds, and actually more seeds per acre. And typically, what germinates is about 80,000 trees per acre. And a lifespan of a tree, or typically, is about 80 years. And so, for these things to mature, and in a mature forest, we have 400, 350 to 400 trees. So somewhere in 80 years, we need to get rid of 79,600 trees. Enter the honey mushroom, which does a big chunk of them. And so it's really important, and not only that, all these little trees are great, because what they do is all the little trees catch up all the nutrients, suck it all there, and they preserve it until something along comes and kills it and recycles this little tree so the nutrient doesn't flow off the Saskatchewan or even further east, places like that. So we keep our nutrient and a lot of stuff right here. So they play really important roles. And again, very specific on what they grow on. So what's it growing under? It's very important. Is it on wood? So here we've got one growing on wood. Actually, this is wood that's covered with moss. And this is one of our cup fungi, one of our ascos. And actually, it doesn't really look like a cup. It looks more like a dinner plate. You can ex include anything that looks like a piece of, uh, piece of, uh, piece of uh, china. Could be an ascomyce. Not just a cup, it could be a bowl, it could be a plate. Is it growing on another mushroom? Important information. So, we're taking notes, so we're finding out ah, it's a gilled mushroom and it's growing on one piece of wood. Really important things. Those are notes that we need to take. It's really important to, to identification because that's what brings us again into the stores, into the right part of the store. And spore color. Spore color is the most important thing. So, here, 
we see the mushroom as it evolved, as it ages. This is the same guy. So this is an agaricus, uh, one of the portobellos. Here, the gills are just starting to off color. They were actually all white when it first, just like the ones in the store. The gills are white. Well, they're dark. They're the store-bought little agaricus are the same as the portobellos that you get with the dark brown gills. It's just that the spores haven't developed. So as they develop, they have that pinky hue, and they end up having this dark brown, chocolate brown spore print. So we're going to make a whole bunch of spore prints, and we'll start doing that this afternoon when we go back and get some specimens. And typically, they're a really important thing. They're the first question. When you have a gill mushroom, what's its spore color? That's really, really important. So what you do is you make the spore print, which you slap the mushroom on a piece of paper covered, and wait. But if you're lucky, what you can do is you keep your eyes open, you can find that there are spore prints already. Here, this is a, you know, the, this uh, Gomphidius, is, or Crocophis, is a little bit sticky on the stalk. And you notice this one has no black on it. Well, this one does because it's matured enough to the deposit in spores, and the spores are black. So we've got a black spore print, and if we pay attention, we can get a lot of that stuff. Here's a little chanterelle with the white spore print, because there was another one on top. Here's a triple oval back sign. Sometimes he spread out so many spores, he dusts the whole ground white. Uh, you find a lot of that with, with local axils. Luke being white, so it's a white axil. And we'll talk about some of those things. And then we need to determine the gill attachment. Really, really important. So here the gills are not. I got a call that this guy here was um, actually from Al Fleming. I found the Agaricus Augustus. I found the prince. The most delicious of all the agaricus, of all the porcini. Absolutely fantastic. And by gum, it certainly looked like it. You know, it has a little bit of a bale and the same kind of kind of cap. And I'm, but I'm looking at the spore color and I'm thinking, yeah, it's a little too gray. It's not really brown enough. And then you look closer, and we know on all of our agarics, what they have is they have gills that are free from the stalk. And if we look here, it kind of looks like it's free, but the gills come back up and they actually go down the stalk, and you kind of see that here. So these gills are notched. And because it has notched gills, well, it's not an agaricus anymore. It's something else. This is a strafaria. And because strafaria is, and actually when you think spore print of it, you'll end up having more of a grayish black spore print rather than that really chocolate brown spore print. So again, Two things. We know the spore color. Well, we know that it has gills and stuff like that. All of that's just intuitive, you know, because we've already gone and figured out that it's Hymenomyces, that's in the order of Agaricales, but we're actually not doing that because we just know because that's what it is. That's how it's organized. We've already learned all of that. Isn't that exciting? Um, so here we, we know two features. Well, three features. It grows on the ground. It's a gilled mushroom. Spore is kind of grayish black. And it's got notched gills. What could that be? Oh, that's probably a strafaria. And now, which strafaria? Who the hell knows? And watch these guys work. What they're doing is they're not pulling stuff out of their brains. They're running to the books. Because you can't keep all that information. You can't keep all that shit inside there. It's just, it's just too much. So you go to the books and you say, but you know which page to go to because you're going to the strafaria page. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's this one. And that's, that's how it's done by world-class mycologists all the time. So you don't have to cut through, you just know how to find, you have to get to the right aisle. Once you get to the right aisle of the book, then you can find the stuff out. Making sense? Does that make any sense? Yeah. And here, we've got a Columbia. Here the gills are almost free, which means that they're just about touching, but they are touching. And they're super crowded. So here, and lots of intermediates. So this kind of stuff is really, really important. The top of the cap, whatever, who cares what that looks like. This is the importance of what's happening underneath and how the stuff joins up. Lactarius deterrence, or one of the lactarius, you know. These ones here, the gills, end up going down the stuff. They're deterrent. Really important. 
So if we have a white spored mushroom with recurrent gills, it's probably a platospy. If it's a little guy, it could be one of the Sauronthalines. Or if it's brown spored, it's probably it's probably a, a Paxillus. So, but you kind of get to know them. So you just need to know like a dozen things in general, and then you get to the right book, and you get these little combinations, and 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 that's typically putting it together. So, for example, here, let's quickly put it together. So here we got we got this gill mushroom growing on the wood. We know it's a hymenomycete. We know it's an agaricales. And well, which one? Um, so it's growing on wood, okay. Spore color is pink. And how do we know that? Well, we actually have taken a spore print, but a lot of times you get a little bit of a hint on it. Once the mushroom's a little older, like if you kind of gaze up into it, you see just about this. Can you see the pinkness in it? I mean, it's very light, but it's just there. And actually, if you kind of stare up at the gills, you see that, that hints of pink. For God's sakes, don't eat the thing, you know, because you think you've seen pink. I mean, take the spore print. But if you're going through the identification, you say, oh, I think this is pink. I'm going to go down the pink aisle, and we'll head down and see what we can find. And the gill attachment is free. So here, in fact, the gills don't touch the stuff. And when I've got those three characteristics, I have a deer mushroom, a pluteus. And they're all edible, for those of you who are interested. They're not great, but you can eat them all. They're fine. So here, we've identified something to genus. Now figure out which one it is. And yesterday, and that's one of the things that uh, we we're talking about, is that there's so many of these Pluteus survivors, these deer mushrooms, which is growing there, that there's actually a whole bunch of different ones. And someday, someone's going to bust them all apart. We're going to not have the deer mushroom. We're going to have 10 different but we'll know some. Be so excited. Step five. So, so those are the big things. The big things. What's the gill attachment? What's the spore color? Where does it grow? You know, we're putting it together. So, and then we're starting to look a little closer. Is it? Is there a veil or a ring? Well, in this case, on this Amanita muscaria, yeah, we have veil or ring. And there it is. Sometimes we have bits of the veil stuck to the cap. Sometimes, you know, sometimes we have all kinds of different choices when it comes here. So, this Lepiola species, here again we've got, sometimes it's a bit of a, bit of a really thin veil, sometimes it's a snotty veil, you know, sometimes it's all kinds of different things, but it leaves this little ring, and the point of all of that stuff is just protecting the gills and the spores while they're developing. So that's an important characteristic at all, as well. So, does it have one? Well, if it's not, then it's something else. If it does have one, you also all of a sudden open the possibilities. But in this one, the, the spore is white, and the gills are free, and white spore mushrooms with free gills are things you should watch out for, because that's their most deadly poison stuff. And in this case, it's a lepiota. And it makes sense that it's a lepiota, because look at it. It's got dots all over the cap. Spots, just like a leopard. And if a leopard was a mushroom, it would be a lepiota too. Because it all makes sense. And so these guys have to watch out for them. Lepiotas. And so what did we know there? A garicale. White, white spore gills that are free. With a little veil. Spot, lepiota, probably poisonous, possibly deadly. Of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. Here's a, and this is why they changed the name. They changed this used to be lepiota or something, then they made it macro lepiota, and now they changed it to chlorophyllum, which it's not lepiota at all, but it's got lepiota like characteristics. And and it's a delicious edible mushroom. But this guy is huge. And actually, it doesn't really have spots. It really actually has scales <coughs> and whatnot. And it's also a white spore mushroom with three gills. We've got better pictures of it later from you. Cortinarius. So this is the only mushroom I want you guys to know. I want you guys to spend time and look at this Cortinarius because, because in Alberta, we have so many Cortinarius that 
It's amazing. You're going to see the table fill up with quaternaries, and with all the brain power we have here, very few of those are going to get a name to them because quaternaries is really hard to figure out which one you've got. But it's really easy to figure out that you've got a court. So probably at this time of the year, I wouldn't be surprised if 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 one fifth of every mushroom that you pick is a quaternary. So maybe one quarter of every mushroom. So right now, in the next five minutes, you'll be able to identify a quarter of all of the mushrooms that you find in Alberta, and they're going to be quaternaries. So what do we have? Quaternaries. Quaternaries means, areas means it's pertaining to a cortina. What's a cortina? Well, a cortina is this little curtain. And curtain or and or cortina. And again, just like the veil, it's protecting the gills as they as they, they develop and it's more mature. And as the cap opens up and it's ready to disperse the stuff, the, the spores, the little the little hairs break and they kind of end up sitting on the stalk. And these mushrooms have rusty brown spores. And so what we end up with is this little rusty brown bit of hair, or we end up actually seeing this. Sometimes the rusty brown is up here, sometimes the veil connection is down at the base, sometimes there's, <coughs> there's 800 to 1,000 different species of these guys, so there's so many. And and you can certainly experiment with eating them. Charles McElvain, who wrote A Thousand American Fungi, ate lots of these. Even he even ate lots of the poisonous ones. They call him Iron Guts McElvain. Because <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, I think, only poisoned himself like 300 times or so about <laughs> writing A Thousand American Fungi. Because he ate every one. And, well, not all of them. He knew some of the deadly ones, and he wouldn't eat those. But he would eat them first, and then, then after he ate them and nothing awful happened, he would phone it, well he wouldn't phone, he would write his friends, because it was the phones then, and invite them for dinner, and feed it to his buddy. <laughs> and then see, how did that work over? Well, okay, this is an edible mushroom, and, and in his book, there's lots of things that he marks edible and delicious, which are awful and terrible, and probably the that you should be, and many of them are quaternaries. He used to make lots of quaternaries, stock ketchup, that was his favorite. Um, so, but there's, there's very few, there's a few species in quaternaries that are really deadly. If you've heard of the, the horse whisperer guy, the, the author, he poisoned himself picking a quaternarius. He ate a quaternarius rubellus, and a quaternarius rubellus has got these toxins that knock the kidneys out. And it knocks, what it really knocks out is the neogenesis of kidney cells. So kidneys kind of replace themselves every three weeks. So what happens is you eat this mushroom, and your regular kidneys are fine, but it's the new kidney cells that are getting compromised, and they're not redeveloping. So now, two and three weeks later, you end up with having kidney failure. So today is what, the 30th? Today is the 1st. So remember, remember August 10th? Remember what you had for supper on August 10th? That might make you not feel good today. So. You know, if you're writing murder mysteries, this is the mushroom. <laughs> but what the amazing thing is, so I'm talking about walking through the woods and making these decisions. Oh, look, I've got an agaric aliens, I've got a gill mushroom, or I've got a bowl of aliens, I've got a bowling. This guy was out picking king bullets. And in king, picking king bullets, which are poured mushrooms with tubes and stuff like that, he came home with these and fed it to his friends and family, and all of them were hospitalized. Three of them had kidney transplants. He had a kidney transplant from his, from his daughter. And he was picking bowlings, and he's an experienced mushroom picker. So, you know, so you need to look. What do I have? I've got a gilled mushroom. It's different than one of these is not like the other. So you pay attention. And that's the thing. So, quaternaries. Here's another quaternaries. Here's a young one. Ooh, look at that. Look at that quartina. And actually, if you get close, you can even see the rusty brown spores starting on top there. Here, we've got another one. Here, we see this fuzziness of rust. 
Sometimes we see little bits of the hair still stuck to the cap with little bits of fuzziness there. Here we see the young one with the Cortina clothes. This one's slimy. Some of them are slimy. Some of them are slimy all over. Some of them are slimy on the cap. Some of the ways you, you start to identify them, like if anybody wants to take on court marriage and just, I'm going to take that on as a personal child. You know, I'm going to learn courts and I'm going to be AVS a media expert, demo. You know? And so there's little characteristics. You taste them and you smell them because they've got interesting smells and you have to use some chemical reagents on them. Sometimes UV light, you know, they, they, they fluoresce in UV. And, but AVS media like, demo. Slime, you know, so is the slime bitter? If it is, then it's one species. If it's not bitter, it's another species. It's just, just that simple. To tell the whole part. So, yeah. What's the difference between the casino and the... AVS media demo. Is it very obvious? It's very obvious. And you'll see that. So pay attention to it. And here, here's another one. So here's another one here. We've got a more bulbous base. And here we see a really heavy ring. AVS media demo. It's really, really light. Sometimes you have to look closely to see that it's coordinate. But once you learn this coordinate, like I said, now you know 25% of all the mushrooms. You've got the genus. AVS media demo. If you want to become an expert and find out which ones you can actually eat, you can. There's another one. A lot of these ports sometimes have these big wide gills and it's pretty much. So coordinate AVS media demo. Here on that page. And sport from Sometimes you get one that's just about bright orange. You get bright orange sports growing on wood, it's a gymnopolis. So here's the only well this is the result. AVS media demo. Patrick will correct me, but he's very polite. And he's not correcting me in all my errors. He would say, well, no, actually, this is now a Cortinarius caparata. They changed it. I choose to call it Mosaitis caparata because it's a little bit different because it doesn't really have... AVS media demo. No, the DNA tells it's actually very close. It's actually really a corp. But here it's got this little ring, and the ring slides up and down, and it's Mosaitis, and... and and so I'm calling it that still, or I can call it the gypsy mushroom, nobody would be upset. AVS Media Demo. Oh, gypsy mushroom, and eventually I'll call it the mushroom formerly known as Residing's Caparata. That's what we have uh, my name for. Uh, and that's one of the only absolutely delicious quartz. And really easy to identify. AVS Media and Demo. Really boggy, things that have that rusty brown score. And we should find some just across the road here in the and again, the ring slides up and down. So, it's... anyways, so also really important. AVS media we demo. We were talking earlier. Pick the whole mushroom. Dig the whole thing out. Because we need to know when it's growing up. It doesn't have a vulva. And so, if it has a vulva, and if it has free gills, well, and if it has AVS a vulva, media demo. And if it has failed then it's one of these deadly amanitas, or potentially deadly amanitas, or it's an amanita. And these are deadly mushrooms. And we don't have very many of these in Alberta. We've got a couple of amanitas out on the table. We've got amanitas AVS here, media which demo. Which is a little bit different. It's not deadly. I mean, it was deadly to a guy in Seattle because he had eaten it, and soon after he had eaten the mushroom, he was shot by police. <laughs> it's a high that he was on. AVS media demo. Scary. And so, well, it's not deadly in itself, but you know what I mean. Anyway, so these are things that you need to. So if you come along and you lock it off here, you don't get that critical thing. So AVS media for, demo. You're picking for the table and for what you're eating. There's a difference between picking for identification. When you're picking for identification, you take your little bag, your little wax bag, and you dig the whole thing out, make sure you have everything, you tough, tuck it in with some AVS media you demo. information, you come back and you super it, and you pour over the course and you figure out what you've got. Once you know what that is, well then you cut the end off in the, in the woods and throw it there and let the squirrels or, or bugs finish eating it and then you clean it up so you don't have to clean up all the mushrooms that you're actually bringing home.
AVS Media demo. But for identification, you need to get down and pick the whole, the whole thing, really critical. So then we get to other things which are kind of less important. Determine the stomp position. Well, you can go through all of these things. AVS Media it's demo. An oyster mushroom that's got a long stalk on it. Well, you don't have an oyster mushroom because it doesn't have a long stalk. It's got a lateral stalk and next to no stalk because that's what it does. And if you find something that, look at the oyster mushroom I have. AVS Media Demo. It's got a long stalk. So, cap shapes, again, those are different things, I mean, that we look at. But those are kind of secondary. Those are the things we're getting into the de the smaller details. AVS Media Demo. Through. We've got to the page, we've kind of said, all right, it looks like it's this one, and now we're going through and reading some of the finer details when we're getting into the little stuff. So here, Suwillis Humbanatus has an umbo. AVS Media Demo. Suwillis Humbanatus has orbs. And it has a snotty veil. And it's a very insipid tasting mushroom. We make, actually, I make a, a, a quite interesting, what I call, in AVS Media soup. Demo. You know, it's, it's fairly, well, it's not bad. These things pan up beautifully, and there's tons of them. Tons and tons. Bacterias. So here we've got a little bit of a funnel shape cap. So, AVS Media Demo. The umbo, here we've got characteristic cap with the ops. And lactarius, of course, lactarius means that it lactates. So again, it means that it exudes the latex. AVS Media Demo. Getting little bits of, little bits of, I think, I think it starts off white. Yeah, it starts off white and then it turns purple right away. And so we got lots of other characters. AVS Media Demo. Gills and a puffball, what's growing on? You know, if you've got a puffball that's growing on, growing on wood, it might be, might have heard on terraforming, pear, terraforming, forming, form, shape, pear, pear, the pear shape. AVS Media oh, Demo. Pear shape goes like a pear. Um, so, and then we start narrowing it down to other characteristics. Here, again, we see this gonfidious glutinosis, which had a veil of snot. And here, the AVS Media Demo. And we're seeing the snotty black spores left to the, to the slimy veil. And if you cut it in half, it's bright yellow inside. And so it's the sliminess. And a lot of times with sliminess, things are slimy. AVS Media we Demo. To figure out which one is something we got. Because with slimy stuff, stuff sticks to the cap. And with dry stuff, it doesn't really stick to the cap because it falls off. So a lot of times you got lots of stuff stuck to the cap, even though it might not be slimy at the time when you're reading. The AVS book, you Media see, Demo. The book says the cap's slimy. Well, but look at all the stuff stuck to the top of the cap, and it probably wasn't <coughs> slimy. So rustlers, rustlers we know by their brittle consistency. David Aurora in his book says you take a rustler. AVS Media you throw Demo. It the tree, and if it shatters into a million pieces, you got a rustler. If you pick up Lumopaxillus and throw it out of the tree and it bounces back to you, you go to Lumopaxillus. Because they're big rubbery things and they don't come apart and whatnot. So, again, all of these things are little characteristics. AVS Media we're Demo. Going to we're going to pick some rustlers and we're going to feel them snap. We're going to feel them snap and we're going to feel, yeah, you can actually hear them snap. That's the characteristic of a rustler. And you get to know rustlers. Rustlers are a good bunch to get to know. AVS Media Demo. Russellas, the two things that are critical on Russellas is you have to taste them. And, and it's good to, and you have to taste a lot of mushrooms. And when I say taste them, I don't mean eat them, I mean you taste it and you see what it tastes like. And AVS so Media Demo. Earlier, you've got these little brown mushrooms that grow on trees with kind of a fairly reddish, orangey spore print. And you taste them, and they're really bitter, like really bitter, like unpleasant. AVS Media and Demo. You know, oh, I got a Gymnopolis. And it's not an edible mushroom, but I have a Gymnopolis, and, and 
you know, it's not edible, might be full of psilocybin and other intoxicants, but they're certainly not the magic. AVS Media Demo. So those are things. So that to not list the bitterness. With Russellas, you have to taste them. You have to have the spore color on a Russella. Russella spore colors kind of go from bright white to kind of deep yellow. Kind of in AVS Media so, Demo. Two characteristics when you're identifying Russellas, big characteristics that kind of divide up all the Russellas is what color is the spore? So if it's a yellow spore, and for example, you taste it and smile, then it's probably, and it's got a red cap, it's Russella borealis, the northern Russella. AVS Media red. Demo. If you've got a Russella that's red that looks exactly like that one, except the spores are white, and it's hot, you've got Russella amenica. And that gives you some serious <laughs> diarrhea. And you taste it, and, and it's just like biting into a habanero. AVS oh, Media you know, Demo. You get that hot bird and then spit it out. And some are just slightly, some it's like they've crunched on a little bit of a, a black pepper. Oh, that's just slightly hot. And so those combination of things tell you a lot about Russell. And this afternoon, AVS we'll Media Demo. Have Russell's, and we'll get you to work through some of those things. But tasting stuff is really, really important. And again, taste it, spit it out. Don't eat it. Nicarius rufus, red hot Nicarius. Well, that's just red hot. Top, it's red. AVS red. Media Demo. It's hot, hot, hot. Smells. Smells, especially your new mushrooms. When you freshly pick them, make notes and bring them back. Smells are just so indicative of mushrooms. And you'll see if you watch, sit back. AVS watch, Media Demo. Paul. Watch Paul identify mushrooms. You'll walk up, and the first thing you'll do. Just about, he'll have a little look in general to find out to, to what. See if he can see a spore color and to see the gill attachment. And the next thing is, is to smell. AVS smell Media Demo. In, instantaneously give these things away. So here we've got Russell is around for the the shrimp smelling Russell. It actually should be the crab smelling Russell because it smells like crab. It smells like seafood. AVS Media Demo. There's some variations in Russella because some of the Russellas actually maybe smell more like people hairy, more like hairy. But you know, so in Latvia they call them the hairy mushroom. Here we call them the shrimp mushroom, even though they should be the. <coughs> AVS Media and these Demo. Are absolutely delicious. They're one of the tastiest mushrooms that are out there. That's one that you should get to know. Some of the edible Russellas you should get to know because they are absolutely fantastic. We in North America typically like a lot of our mushrooms fried. AVS Media fried Demo. So nicely, really, really good. Other mushrooms stew up nicely and other mushrooms get into soups and different things. So smell is really important on, on a lot of identifications. AVS um, Media people, Demo. People, uh, David Aurora calls this is a, a bum which is a big, boring, ubiquitous mushroom. So it's kind of brown, gray, blah, 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 mushroom. There's no particular characteristic to it. It doesn't have a veil, it doesn't have a ball, AVS it doesn't Media have Demo. Really nothing. But if you smell it, it smells like a raw potato or a cucumber. And all of a sudden, oh yeah, there it is. No characteristics, and it smells like a potato or a cucumber. That's a hemoloma. But if you actually start looking a little AVS Media Demo. Um, actually, if you go back, if you actually start taking a look a little closer at these hemolomas, you know, the hemoloma, sometimes you need a little hand lens or poro hand lens. You look at the edge of the gill. The AVS the Media right. Demo. And so that's one of the characteristics of hemoloma. So it's just getting these little details. And a lot of times, how do you know you look for that detail? Well, I think I have a hemoloma. And you go through, okay, because it smells like a AVS radish, Media like Demo. radish kind of boring looking things or hemolomas, and I'm going to go and read up about which one do I have, hemoloma. AVS Media Demo. Gills, pinkish buff at first, adenine. Um, so kind of broadly attached, and serrate edges. Serrate means, so I look, what the hell is that? I look in my book and serrate, oh, like a bread knife. So then I look, 
AVS Media Demo. That's exactly what it is. So a lot of times you get these big generalities to kind of get you into the thing and then you, then you start reading descriptions and then you go back and the thing goes and says, look closely, see if you see that. And, and you let the mushroom book guide AVS Media to Demo. all of these little things. So, you know, one of those things I've memorized, I know in the field, I'll take a look and say, oh look, I know, it's a hebeloma about the serrated village. <clears throat> discoloration of flesh. So lots of things discolor. So AVS Media Demo. Real, when you cut it in half, it turns black. Here's this macroleptiodor coating, or this chlorophyll that they're calling it now. This great big lepiodor looking thing. It's actually the shingles rather than the dog. So the interesting character. AVS Media Demo. Light support, free gill, which should make you be a little more cautious. But as soon as you cut it in half, it turns brown. I mean, if you watch it, it turns this red brown in front of your eyes. Like, you know, cut it. One, two, three. AVS you know, Media red Demo. And brown, and you watch it happen. And, and so that's the one characteristic that'll give you this mushroom. And again, and how do you know that? Well, you kind of, you go through the book and you get to it, and then if you still don't know and you get to the point. AVS Media that, Demo. Watch it. And so we'll, you'll be seeing that a lot too, people cutting stuff here and, and looking at it and seeing how it bruises. And growth habits. So does it grow in groups, does it grow in clusters? So there's all these different things. Actually, this one I should have had under smells. AVS Media smells Demo. Like garlic. It smells like garlic and onions. You know, if you chopped a whole pail of onions and a whole pail of garlic and you put them together in a bucket and you left it standing out on your kitchen counter overnight. AVS Media you Demo. It, you pull the lid off and you smell it. That's what you'd smell. You'd smell one of these kinds. And they're typically not edible. Some people eat them, but some people get gastrointestinal bleeds with them. So we don't... AVS Media Demo. Typically, uh, suggest that you do. In Europe, they eat a lot of them. But that's one of the reasons for the microflora, what Tom's saying. So we're calling these things the same things here as they do in Europe. So for example, that hebeloma, that poison pie, one of the things... AVS Media is, Demo. Uh, in Europe, it poisons people, and it's quite unpleasant. I mean, you don't die from it. You got this big gastric upset, and it's just a miserable time. And exactly the same mushroom here. Well, it doesn't AVS smell like Media it's Demo. And nobody ever gets poisoned. And in 30 years of NAMA research, of NAMA, NAMA poison mushrooms, there's never been a poison mushroom, uh, a mushroom poisoning from Hevaloma crustalina formi, this poison pie, which poisons. AVS poison Media poison Demo. So maybe people like Tom Bruns comes along and says, maybe actually these aren't the same. Huh? What do you think? It's this the same, and that's what's happening. So the one thing we know about Hebeloma crustalina for me is that it's not Hebeloma crustalina. AVS that's Media Demo. Sure. It's not what it is, and, but it's still the best name that we have for it. Isn't that cool? And that's the welcome, welcome to the mushroom world. And that kind of stuff happens all the time. So here, let's kind of take a look at what we've got. AVS so Media Demo. Hey, there's a mushroom growing on the ground. Hmm, in grass. Oh, look at that. It's a gilt mushroom. That means it's a, it's a hybrid of mice. AVS Media Demo. Well, let's look a little closer. So, the spore prints white. Well, how do we know the spore prints white? Well, I just moved this cat part here and we just saw that it was white. Or I took it home and I made a spore print. And saw that AVS Media white, Demo. White. What we really mean is we don't mean white. We mean light. So it could be white, it could be a little beige, it could be a little almond, it could be a little bone color, ivory, all of those. AVS Media spore. Demo. It's not a dark brown spore print. Those are the things. And actually, the details of the spore print color sometimes will separate some species out. But in this case, it doesn't matter. The spore print, the spore color is white or light. And when we look at the gills, AVS Media Demo. Well, they're close to free. What does that mean? Well, it means that 
they're just touching the cap unless the mushroom started to dry out, then it's actually pulling away from the cap because the cap is drying out. So, but they're really close. Just AVS Media demo. It's really wide. So what we have is we've got really wide spaces with these lots of intermediates in between. Hmm, that's really important. And the stock is tough. AVS Media and demo. The stock, look at the stock, we can actually just go tighter than not. When we've got these characteristics, then we end up having a fairy ring. That's what it is. It just you know, we've gathered a few fine bits of information. AVS Media Demo. Hang on, is this a fairy ring? Well, it looks like a fairy ring from the top. And it grows in a ring and it grows in the grass. But actually, we're looking at this. Hang on, this one's got a veil. This isn't a fairy ring at all. And now we're looking a little closer. Oh, look. AVS Media Demo. Wow. It has intermediates, but they're kind of crowded. This is actually an Niagara side. The point is, is that when you pick the mushroom, take a look at what you got. Because the one growing by, beside it might be AVS Media Demo. Might be something that's different. So that's how the horse whisperer guy got it. He's picking bowlings. Da, 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 here we go. And the ones that kind of look brownie on top, the same one were these Cordinarius rubellus. And he picked them and nope. AVS them Media up. Demo. Backside of me into the basket it goes. So pay attention. Important stuff. And when you're the cook, pay attention. The cook should always know a little bit about mushrooms. Because it might be something that you shouldn't be eating. Especially if you're cooking bowling. AVS Media Demo. Oh yeah, little brown mushrooms. So, there's lots of little brown mushrooms. If you want to find a new species, focus on little brown mushrooms. And typically they're called LBMs and there's about a bunch of AVS Media Demo. The thing about little brown mushrooms is that, is that, well, not all of them are little. Some of them are little big in size. And when you look at, like, these ones here that I illustrated, these little brown mushrooms aren't even brown. AVS Media so Demo. Lots of these little guys. Little guys, and, you know, they're tough. So as you're starting out, try and avoid those. So when you're in the woods, you know, when you see all these little brown ones, I know sometimes when you're starting out and you're excited, I want to pick every one and look at them. AVS Media Some Demo. Some of them little ones, you know. Maybe bring one little one home to just, to just you know, have a little chortle at yourself. I'm going to amuse myself with seeing if I can figure out this little one. Probably the little ones that dry out so fast and hard to get And those are the ones AVS that Media the Demo. big ones you'll find in the book. The little ones, I mean, she actually is one of the few authors that actually did little ones, little, some little brown mushrooms, so she's got some in here. But, um, okay, so what time do we have? AVS Media Demo. 11, 14, oh, this has been going very good. So, here, so here's the end, the start, or maybe, maybe your the start, maybe actually, actually the start of the end. Why don't we stretch for AVS a Media Demo. Washroom. I need to get a little bit of water and then we're just going to go through a few picking tips and then when we're going to go out this afternoon, we're going to go out and pick some mushrooms and then we're going to come back and we're going to start dealing with them. And, uh, and we're, I just want to go AVS Media Demo. When, we're, when we come back.